two, one. Welcome to Potter Familias. Coming to you from Fairhope, Alabama. So where do you buy the majority? Oh, I'm Todd Sylvester. And I'm Stephen Sylvester. I was about to remind you. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a while. <laughs> it's okay. Where do you buy the majority of your clothes? Uh, believe it or not, from Amazon. Really? Yeah. How do, how, how do you try things on? The well, drone delivers it? Well, no. Uh, some, some brands let you do this thing called wardrobe, prime wardrobe, where yeah. you can just choose a bunch of stuff. They'll send it all to you, and you send back whatever doesn't fit, and you only have to pay for what you keep. So they, it's almost like they're undermining those companies that do that, and that's right. their shtick, right? You know, and I I only do that because it's so hard for me to find pants that actually fit. And now things have changed for you. Huh? They have. I've gone down two pant sizes in the past year. That's gotta feel good. It's crazy. It's like I I don't feel like I'm changing that much, but then I look at pictures of me from two years ago, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, everybody's been mentioning it. They are, which is which is crazy. What's your son's secret? Yeah. What's his secret? Eating less i guess and not thinking about it i don't know <laughs> i mean it is kind of just a simple equation it's true it's not rocket science it's like i do eat less than i used to and have now for two years so that's awesome yeah good stuff recently i was invited to some people's house and they wanted to know my take on a lot of people leaving the church especially young people and what to do concerning that and right they were like, all right, Todd, from all your youth ministry experience, what's the deal? And I said, well, the problem is that we're not, I don't think, witnessing our number one properly. Mm. And they said, okay, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, if I had anyone, you know, a parent to come to me and say, oh, you know, I'm having these difficulties with my child. I'd say, all right, let me talk to your child one-on-one -on -one in my office, closed door. And the first question is, what is your parents number one? Yeah. As in like, what's the most important thing in their life? The absolute most important. Right. Not the thing they say is most important, but the thing that is I apparent to their I can care less kid. what you say. Right. Because that to me is useless if your life doesn't follow it up. Mm -hmm. I can say I'm into sports. <laughs> yes. Right. You can laugh. You can laugh because <laughs> I can say it all day long. But that doesn't make it true. Right. It doesn't make it true because yeah. my life doesn't mirror that. My life is not making that reality manifest because it's not the reality. That's fair. Just like people that say, well, I'm, I'm into fitness. Mm. Now, some of but them are. What does that mean? Because exactly? they look great. And the definitions are different for everybody, which right. is why definitions are so important. But the perspective of a child is a, a really important thing. Oh, yeah. It's very honest. And, and oftentimes they would give answers that were good. They would say, oh, mm -hmm. my mom's most her number one is family. Yeah, that's a good one. It is. My dad's number one is work. Mm -hmm. And that's an important one. Right. It's not we've like got to keep a, a roof over the head. It's not and, a bad thing. Yeah. The problem is, in my perspective, the number one thing is that which needs to be number one. And it's not family. And it's right. not your work. And it's not sports. And it's not fitness. Right. It's a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. It's It's your faith life. And let me explain real quickly is the fact that if God really is, then he deserves the number one spot, period. Right. If he's not, if atheists are right, then who cares what number one is? Right. It can be anything it's you want. as subjective and unique as there are people who believe in things. If you came to me and said, my number one is ice cream, I'd be like, right on. But also, you have to remember that a lot of people are coming at this, like, what's the most important thing in your life? I think most people are not in a place where they understand how logical conclusions work in terms of like ideas that are supposed to define you right? and what you believe in. I think they, they sort of, and I'm just basing this off of the people that I know who don't share the same background of education where it's like they didn't go to school for the same stuff that I did, which was specifically to teach in the church, right? right? right. To do catechesis. Okay. And my experience has been that people who don't share that background there's a handful of people that I have met who have no catechetical background whatsoever. They don't work for the church. They don't even really volunteer with the church. And yet they have a profound, like a profound understanding of how to make sure that God is the number one thing in their life, if that's what they believe in. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time, most people don't, they don't even have the, like, 
the words to be able to describe what that's like. They might on a visceral like surface level understand the thing that I'm most into is what I'm supposed to be most passionate about. And I'm supposed to pour all of my energy into that. They get it, but they also don't understand why the thing that they're pouring themselves into that's a worldly thing is not supposed to be their number one. Because if they're being honest, that's what it would be. Right. But I got a, I had a dad that many years ago got really mad at me. Mm-hmm. I mean, like was cussing me out in my office oh, because wow. I asked the question and I said, well, that's not that shouldn't be your number one. And he said, who are you to tell me that, Todd? This is my life. And I'm like, I, no, I understand that. Mm-hmm. You can put anything into number two that you want. But number one has to be a faith in God yeah. if you have a faith in God. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like, it can't be anywhere else. Right. And to try to teach them philosophically how that works, there is the hierarchy of the good. Yes. And goodness has to be number one. Everything has to flow from that. But you almost have to go back to basics in order for people to understand how that works. Like, okay. I got in trouble one time when I was helping out with a youth group at a certain parish that I won't name. And this was many years ago. And I was like the guest speaker. So I got up there and I noticed after a while, after I've been talking for about five minutes, just kind of sharing my story, whatever. And I wasn't as experienced at the time. So it probably was kind of boring to, you know, to be fair to the kids. But I noticed that they were losing interest. And I was like, look, how many of you guys are Catholic? How many of you guys, if I ask you, you'd say, yeah, I'm Catholic. Everybody's hand. How many of y'all, if I ask, are you just going to church because your parents are making you put your hands down? About half of them put their hands down. And I said, y'all, the rest of you, if you're not going to church and if you're not believing in this stuff because it's what you actually believe in and you've actually thought this through, stop coming. Whoa. And I, it's because I was angry. Like, mm-hmm. I would never do that in youth group now because I honestly, I want people to get involved and I want to try and build a relationship with them. It's not about them having that core belief exactly how I want them to. But illustrated this point which is most people are not in a position where they can even understand this stuff so if you just throw the truth in their face about what should be the number one thing in their life and they respond like that dad did yeah well and and i even posed the question because i knew at the time that you know he was he's married and he mm-hmm. seemed to have a happy marriage and so forth and but i you said, gotta well, get him thinking about it but i said what if you went home and you told your wife of all human relationships you're number four I mean, you're way up there. Gotcha. You're you're I mean, way up there. That's that is dominantly in the top 10. Mm -hmm. How would she feel about that? Now, fortunately, it lightened it up and made him laugh. Right. Because I didn't want him to smack me. But the point the point is, we have to understand that we and we have to be conscious about what our number one is. Right. And then our life has to reflect that it has to show that and all of it all of your life has to reflect it well, it's, right. it's not something that can just be you know compartmentalized into whenever you go to church and then whenever you go to men's group it's like that's not enough and then anywhere else right you know i can you can do whatever you want up a and storm you can, on the golf you can live whatever kind of life you want to and i'm saying this as somebody who like i've got stuff that i need to work on that i know doesn't reflect the gospel i'm aware but at least i know and at least I'm like, but, all right, these are things on. that I have to work on. This, this is an important point, though. Yeah. You say, at least I know. So you're recognizing that those are faults. Those mm-hmm. are failures. Those yes. are sins. Yes. And you're calling a spade a spade. Because yeah. our problem in today's culture is instead, this is what we do. We go, well. Is it really that really bad? Really not that bad. It's not that bad. I mean, in comparison and to the I, people that I'm are in saying, jail. On record, I'm saying on record, it is that bad. It yeah. is stuff that if I don't go to confession will send me to hell. Right. Now, hopefully not like mortal sins all the time. But you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, no, it's I know important, exactly it's important what you to mean. call that out. But you see, you're you're showing right now what but your the, number one is. But the reason why I'm doing it is because that's how you make it number one in your life. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to understand how the hierarchy works. And then at the end of the day, when you do an examination of conscience, you can recognize and go, yeah, I didn't live up to my number one. But I know how I can do better. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then you make those adjustments in your life. And then tomorrow yeah. is a new day. Again, it's not rocket science. And hopefully tomorrow is actually a better day. I would hope so. That's 
that's how it's supposed to work. I am supposed to be a better person today than I was yesterday. Amen. And I'm supposed to be a better person tomorrow than I am today. That's exactly right. And it might not be like huge, noticeable things that are going on, movements in my life. Sometimes there are. Sometimes there's cool mountaintop experiences, retreat experiences, huge conversions. Those you know, are nice. Big 180s. But it, then you get to a kind of a point in time in your life when you you start on the block of marble doing the sculpture. Yeah. At first, you're taking big chunks off, like just big jam and chisel, bam, sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. And then you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then finally, you're just kind of smoothing things out a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's that's the life. That's the life. Because yeah. I'm trying to live according to my number one. That's my relationship with God. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to Potter Familias. You guys are awesome.